So I've been working on this for a while, and it's time I actually formally introduce it, because I happen to be very impressed with this project. This is going to cover two uh, separate assemblies, that is, in the .NET world, projects compiled into individual libraries um, that belong to the same solution. And the original one was called Stringier, as it's sort of an extension library to strings in general. Um, so it kept with that name. The other one is going to be an implementation of pattern combinators. Not to be confused with parser combinators. That was built sort of on top of this. Uh, does use some of the uh, Stringier extensions. Um, we'll get into that. So first, covering the Stringier Extensions Library. What is it? And I think one of the best ways to start covering this is to actually talk about what it's not. It's not a new string class. It is quite literally an extension library on top of car, innumerables of car, string, and innumerables of string. Now, because it works on innumerables, that means whether you have an array of car or string, a list of car or string, or whatever, as long as it's an innumerable, it will work on those. So, you've got your bases covered. And this is going to be a non-exhaustive uh, coverage of some of the extensions that it provides. Um, it's pretty minimal, to be perfectly honest. There's a lot there. Uh, I will have down in the video description a link to the documentation website all this is on. I highly recommend checking that out and it covers these in considerably more detail, but let's show off some of the useful ones. Well, they're all useful, but... Uh, clean takes any instances of multiple spaces and uh, reduces them down into a single space while also trimming spaces from the beginning and the ending. So if you have, you know, the string hello world, but with excessive amounts of spacing that you don't want there, a single clean operation will reduce it down to a nice, tidy hello world string. Uh, ensure begins with. There's also a related ensure ends with. I wound up needing these quite a bit and found it's much easier to just call this instead of check if it's there and then do the appropriate thing if it is or isn't. So ensuring that Mr. is in front of any name, it takes Bob Saget and returns Mr. Bob Saget, but if you've already got Mr. Bob Saget, it just gives you back Mr. Bob Saget. Um, I have listed here just for string array. The join works on any innumerable, so it, it's not specifically arrays. Uh, in this case, there already is a string.join. However, it this was before extension methods were a thing. And so they kind of had to do that, where it's inside of a uh, from the C-sharp world, a static class, from the Visual Basic world, a module. Um, and I added this in here to just kind of show that a lot of these things that were in these modules before, you can call through extension methods now. Uh, just kind of makes it more, one, orthogonal, and two, kind of convenient to see what's there. Since when you're working with any of these languages, you primarily do it through extension methods, and if you don't see the... or not extension methods, but you primarily do it through methods, and if you're 
you know, going through seeing the instance methods and it's not there, it's actually a static method belonging to a static class, it, it, it can be easy to forget that these things are there. So this just kind of helps with that. And I've got the example there for anybody who doesn't know what a join does, but most of you are probably aware. Um, then there are some utility things like occurrences, which just simply counts the occurrences of whatever you specified. Uh, in this instance, the single character that you specified. And because these are useful, the conversions are a little bit trickier than some people expect. Uh, we've got two camel case where it takes a string and converts it to two camel case. Uh, to Pascal case is another one, although there are others as well. Uh, just to kind of expand beyond just to lower and to upper. So then some ideas for future work. Um, right now, as I had explained, these are only working on car, I enumerable of car, um, string, and I enumerable of string. It would be nice to make these take spans of car as a parameter and also return spans of car as a parameter. Now, I, I suppose I'm pretty sure the span already implements enumerable. Um, I might be wrong there, but just because of specifically what these are, it would be a good idea to have uh, a specific implementation around it to kind of cut back on the amount of copying or allocations or other things um, that the more generic um, methods would act actually have. So then getting into the real meat of this presentation is the patterns implementation in string years. So what is this exactly? What is a pattern combinator? And again, I think it'd be a good starting point to say what it's not. It's not regex, and I think I forgot to add this in here, but it's not a parser combinator either. Uh, this is quite a different approach, and this is why I'm explaining it here. No, I did remember. Good on me. So now, what what is this? Uh, it takes inspiration from Snowball 4, Spitball, and Unicon. Uh, in my instance, primarily from Unicon, but Unicon ultimately comes from Spitball 4, or Snowball 4. And heavily inspired by how they did parsing, because it was, I, I find, a very elegant approach. But I need to add some further information about what this is, is not. And it's not a Snowball clone. It, it's not copying that approach. It's inspired by it, but it is not the same approach. So why do this? Why create a new thing? And regex sucks. Say we have a regex for matching a name. In this specific instance, um, really just any word followed by an optional amount of spaces and other words um, would handle many cases of names, uh, although I'm sure someone's name out there probably violates this. But then you have a closing statement, like a closing statement for a letter, where you, you know, you sign off. And I'd like to combine these. I want to do this. The sincerely, followed by the name that I had already written, followed by a comma. But instead, I have to create an entirely new regex with everything contained inside of it. Now, just to be fair, because I know somebody's going to bring this up, you can save parts of the regex as independent strings and string concatenate them. There are 
issues with that, like having to remember downstream when you're actually using the declaration that you had before, whether or not you need to add Wern boundaries or not. And you have to be careful for a lot of reasons. It winds up being quite fragile. And really just regex was not designed around any kind of don't repeat yourself or reusability in any way. So that same kind of example using patterns, the name declaration is exactly the same. Uh, we'll cover exactly what these different operators are uh, really soon, but this is just to sort of show the general comparison. The closing statement, the, the closing pattern rather, um, winds up working. You, you do exactly what we want to do. And it winds up basically being the same comparison. Um, some of the internals are slightly different, of course. It's not the same thing, but it's basically the same comparison. And in these instances, everything is so similar that it's pretty much one-to-one -one comparisons. And this is clearly a reusable approach. Now, just to address something on this, this idea that patterns died out, there is actually quite a list of Snowball 4 or Spitball inspired pattern libraries. There are even a language group, a small language group, but a language group inspired by these. So some of the concepts behind this. A literal is just an exact match, and as you can see, it's declared by just assigning it a string as if it's just a string. Uh, as long as the language you're using does implicit conversions, this works. Um, I do have in that documentation I alluded to earlier, uh, examples in both C sharp and F sharp. I, I find just given how, how this works, uh, the C Sharp and Visual Basic implementations are pretty much identical, uh, so you don't really need to know, you don't really need the additional examples for Visual Basic, but the, there is F Sharp specific support for this. Um, partially dealing with the fact that there aren't implicit conversions in F Sharp, uh, partially just making it more of a functional friendly design. And there is some more I want to say about that uh, later. Um, you'll know when I get to that, but uh, just keep in mind for now that much like regex, you can use these patterns in any language. It's not a specific implementation. So then we have the alternator. Uh, basically, just match either of these. You're defining the second choice as an alternate of the first. And it's just done by an OR statement. Uh, chained match or concatenators. I see I used the old name I had here when I was originally implementing it. That's my bad. Uh, this should say concatenator. But it's just chaining them. So the first before the second before the third. Or conversely, the second comes after the first, the third comes after the second. Uh, repeating matches, just saying it has to happen this amount of times. Um, I do have planned making this work with the new .NET range type, so saying that it must happen between this and this other amount. Um, right now it's just on this specific amount. Uh, there's also the spanner, which at least what I'm calling it, but it's repeating it but repeating it one or many times. Um, you'll find, in most cases, these are very, very similar to the regex definitions. And I'll cover a little bit more about this, but basically it's because the design of this is you describe what it is that you want to parse. You describe the match not how to do it. And that's what regex does. 
and it's different from what parser combinators do. Um, optional, same kind of thing. I, I do want to say that in this instance, the regex, this works because it's declaring that it's lazy. Uh, that it should be lazily parsed or lazily matched or however it is they describe that. Um, the pattern does not quite work the same way, but based on how most people use it, it it's the same kind of thing. And in fact, in the regex example I gave there, it is the same thing. Um, where that lazy symbol, the, the, the question mark, actually differs is when you put it behind like a, a dot star and then the question mark, then it changes behavior quite a bit. And um, the next example will cover a little bit about that. Oh, wait, I think the next example is on... Cons Oh no, it is. Okay. So what about the clean star? Because I don't have a specific symbol for the clean star. Um, you just make a spanner optional and it just, it does exactly what you would think it does. Um, just to kind of allude to one of the features of this, there are some pitfalls. Like if you were to reverse these, by making example optional and then spanning, so you reversed the operators, so it's plus minus example, that actually winds up creating an infinite loop when parsing. And that is caught at construction time. So when you define the pattern, when the runtime goes in to initialize that variable, it will throw an exception there fully explaining exactly what was wrong. So it will catch that issue and tell you that you probably meant to write those the other way around. Uh, capture and back reference. So th this one is on the capture part of it. And basically you just call a capture method and have your output with the capture type the capture type basically being a string, uh, just with some trickery to make it lazily resolved. Because that's actually important when you go to use it as a back reference. For the actual back reference side of this, you just take that output result and throw it back into a pattern, and because of lazy resolution, it winds up working quite well. So, those of you who watch my other videos know damn well that I care quite a bit about performance and don't think people measure it anywhere near enough. In fact, a big gripe of mine is the large amount of programmers who love to say things like, oh, our solution is really performant and lightweight, but you have no evidence. I'm not doing that. So let's get into this. I've benchmarked these extensively, and these benchmarks are in the repo, so if you want to run them yourself on your own machine, go right ahead. I want to see any variations, any oddities. I don't want to pretend that I outperform these others' implementations of text parsing, matching, whatever you want to call the broad group. I, I don't want to say I'm better than them or whatever. I want it to be very, very clear how these stack up. So when it comes to parser performance, so this is specifically, you already have the pattern or regex or parser combinator thing done. You've already initialized that to a variable. This is the performance of when you call the regex.match, the um, run for the parsec, or any of the parsers that the my, my approach uh, works with. There was no section on that. Technically, there are different 
because of the separation, because what you're defining is a pattern, there's different parsers that can be called on that. Again, check with the documentation. Um, there will be a link. That'll go into far more detail, especially since I don't want to cover them too much here because I don't know how many more I'm going to add. But basically, as you can see, the performance of this stacks up pretty well. Um, you find the performance of Microsoft's regex implementation tends to lack quite a bit, although it's not terrible. Like, generally speaking, FParsec beats it out, but it's, it's not terrible. But overall, you can't see a whether I'm a clear winner or loser. It's just kind of... I'm competing. Um, one thing to note, I am not super familiar with FParsec. I did not want to create misleading benchmarks for things that I could not figure out how to implement well or could not find a good implementation of already. So I left out the web address and IPv4 address uh, implement um, benchmarks. So you will not see them for this. Um, I'm sorry. If you know how to implement those well in FParsec, please add them to the benchmarks. I don't know. I'm not going to mislead people. So the next thing is how much memory usage occurs while parsing. And you can see that FParsec uses up quite a bit. Um, Microsoft's implementation is a bit more lightweight as far as memory goes. And in, what, two cases I'm competitive with Microsoft, and one case Microsoft beats me out really badly. Um, I'm pretty sure I do not have an optimal description of a web address pattern yet. That's sort of a pitfall in using a new design is I don't necessarily know the best way to use my own thing. Um, but in two cases, I'm using up substantially less memory, and I'm quite happy about that. One thing to note is for the phone number, while it looks like I forgot to do the benchmark or whatever, uh, at least on my machine, it doesn't require any memory uh, allocations to do that. So that's cool. So then we got into how much time is spent actually constructing these. So that is when you assign the regex or the pattern or whatever to the literal. How much time does it take for the, for the runtime to construct that object? Um, for both my own and FParsecs, it's pretty efficient, actually. Uh, doesn't take very long at all. I beat FParsec by quite a bit, and Regex is just, oh my god, like, it, it takes quite a bit more time. Now, while this might seem quite alarming, you only initialize it once, and you're probably using it multiple times, so it's really not that bad. Um, don't use this as your primary factor with deciding what approach you want to use. This is not your top priority in the majority of situations. Um, but the fact that mine winds up being the fastest is actually extremely important with something I'm going to talk about towards the end with how patterns can be optimized under the hood. Self-optimizing, whatever you want to call it. But it's possible to have the constructor rewrite parts of the pattern in ways that are known to be more efficient. That is extra work, but because mine is so fast when it comes to construction, that extra work still has me as faster. So then the memory usage, as you can see, it winds up basically being the same. The exact values are a little off, so the ratios relative to each other are off, 
but it basically looks like the same thing. Mine winds up being the most lightweight as far as construction goes, followed by a Parsec with Microsoft being abysmal. But this isn't the whole picture. And in fact, one thing you want to do is check against a failing match. That is, you have something like a pattern, regex, whatever, that would match a phone number, but the phone number is typed incorrectly. There's a letter in it or something. How does it respond to a bad match? You can see mine does well, really well. Uh, in fact, the numbers wind up being basically the same for the successful match. Uh, Microsoft's, as far as performance, wound up being about the same without and but when it failed, it did not need to use any memory. I believe that is because regex systems typically, and Microsoft's definitely does not use any type of error reporting. When it doesn't work, you just kind of know that it doesn't work and you don't know at what point it failed. That's part of the reason why these, these um, regex tester websites are quite popular. And I know I've used them extensively because it can be a little tricky to debug those kinds of things. But uh, my approach, as well as FParsecs, do error reporting. Clearly, one of us handle failures and do error reporting much more efficiently. So then I stress test them. And stress testing was done by generating a very large string. Um, what I did specifically was from one to, or from zero all the way up to the integer max size divided by four. Um, if you were to write this out to a file, it would be just over half a gigabyte large. And the string contains uh, random selection from an array of every lowercase letter in English, uh, as well as a space. So what you get are these words delimited by spaces. Uh, this was done because it's quite easy to implement a match or a parser for these. Because the primary purpose of this test is how does it respond when consuming incredibly large files? Because things don't scale linearly. Something that performs really well on the small scale doesn't necessarily perform the same way on the large scale. And you can clearly see with the results here that the performance did not scale. The, the examples, the, the, the charts I showed before are not represented here now. And what are the findings with this? Good job with the scalability Microsoft. I, I seriously commend that. I expected you to be the worst performing, and as it turns out, you beat mine across the board. Like, seriously, really good job. Uh, clearly, if you're working with absolute massive files, uh, theirs is a good approach to use. Mine holds up well, though, uh, just barely trailing behind. Uh, one thing to note is that Microsoft's approach does use a little bit of memory. Eight kibibytes exactly. I'm very surprised to see them using less memory uh, than both uh, mine and FParsex. I, I don't know why this is the case. I, I don't know why mine is using so much. Um, it's you know still a fairly new product, so I still have quite a bit of performance optimization to do. I, I just, I clearly need to do some diagnostics and figure out why that's, why that's the case. I, I did not expect it to use that much. But still, it's not that bad. Uh, it's definitely beating out what is claimed to be uh, just as efficient as a handwritten parser. 
It's that parsecs. That's what, that's what they like to claim. Um, I think they should do a little more testing. Because that performance for F parsecs is really, really bad. Do not use that on large files at all. No. So if you went and implemented a thing for F parsec for, uh, you know, really massive bits of data, like a CSV from, I don't know, seismographs or whatever. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You gotta rewrite that whole thing. This is, the performance is terrible. So ideas for future work for this, because there are a lot in this instance. Uh, there needs to be more pattern types and parsers. Uh, something that I had not implemented at all is look ahead and look behind. Um, I'm looking into, no pun intended, a way to unify this um, so that you can just simply state that a specific part of a pattern should be looked for. Um, but basically what a look ahead or look behind is, um, you check to make sure that it's there. It has to be there for a successful match but it's not actually going to be returned as part of the result. I'd like to unify that to where you can just say, hey, look for this, and based on where it winds up in the constructed pattern, it makes it a look behind, look ahead, a look behind, or I guess a skip. And it's something in the middle that must be there, but you don't want as part of the results. I don't have a find parser yet either. Uh, that would work similar to the match in regex, where unless it's anchored to the beginning, it goes and finds the thing. And then others. Uh, there is something I'm working on that I will talk a bit about. Um, I don't know where. So there are some need for further optimizations in that I need to identify more instances where patterns can be rewritten and implement that rewrite. Um, luckily these rewrites are actually really easy to implement because they work through a sort of synthesized multi-dispatch. Um, it's not exactly multi-dispatch, but it's not function overloading there is some dispatching going on. Another thing is to investigate whether or not to use unsafe code. Um, I'm not sure about Microsoft's approach, especially since they have different implementations for the Net Framework and the uh, Net Core. I'm not sure what they're doing on both of those. But FParsec is using unsafe code and is part of why it's so fast but I'm not using that yet. And to be perfectly honest, I'm not sure if I want to. Oh, there we go. Another thing that I need to wait for in this instance, um, both of these libraries are implemented on Net Standard 2.0. I don't really have access to the stuff that was provided with Netcore 2.1 or Netcore 2.2 yet. The ability to make a span of car from a stream was introduced with Netcore 2.1. I will implement this as soon as I have the appropriate net standard version, but it hasn't been officially released yet. So that's that. I'm sorry, but I gotta wait. Another thing is more predefined patterns. Um, completely forgot to mention this in its entirety, but Inside of the Patterns class, there is a large collection of static, predefined 
patterns. This includes basic things like what you would know as a um, a character group in regex uh, for things like, hey, match any letter, match any number, match any space, match any control character. These are already defined. Uh, it would be good to have predefined patterns for bigger things like an entire email address or an entire URL. This way, not only do you not have to worry about the complexity of some of these patterns, because some, like the URL, get really complex, but also it's implemented in the most efficient way known. So, I want to just give some notes about fparsec. Um, I suppose you could say I'm shitting on it a little bit here. I'm, I'm not... Yeah. So some, some stuff I gotta say about language compatibility. Uh, fparsec was defined in f -sharp. There, There's part of it that's defined in C-sharp so that they can have the unsafe code bits. Um, but the libraries are forced into... The assemblies are forced merged into one single thing. Um, one single NuGet package. There isn't really C-sharp support. Not officially, anyways. It was defined overwhelmingly um, in F-sharp and is meant to be used in F-sharp. There is a third-party binding to it in C-sharp. It's a little wonky. In my approach, however, while it was defined in C-sharp, because Visual Basic is so similar, I did some basic tests just to make sure that the operators did not collide and you could define the same things in Visual Basic, but it just works exactly as you would expect. Um, you could do that same approach in F-sharp, but just as to kind of make it more functional, I do have a full binding library for F-sharp where everything is exposed in a way that is very what you would expect in a functional environment. All of these are official supported things. The entire design was took into consideration the needs of all these languages. And there is also an official API for bindings that I created that was used for the F-sharp uh, implementation, but you could use for bindings for other languages as well. Updates for FParsec seem to have slowed down substantially. I don't know if the project has been abandoned or not, but not a lot has happened in, what, over six months now? There's a growing number of issues that have been reported that aren't even getting comments on, let alone fixes. I don't know what's going on there. It's definitely not finished. They haven't declared it uh, complete. There are things that they have declared in the works that it just seems like nothing's happening anymore. Another note is that because fparsec is a parser combinator, you're stringing together parsers. You're describing how to parse the text. So there are specialized parsers that you have to use. Even though they parse what is basically the same thing, you have to know which ones of these you want to use in which situations. You have to go through and you know, structure the thing optimally because you're responsible for performance. Whereas with my approach, you're only responsible for describing it. So there is what I'm calling the underscore nightmare with these specialized parsers. There are languages like F sharp that allow underscores inside of numeric literals. Ida is another one. In fact, if you're watching this video, you, there's a good chance you're one of the people who regularly watches the stuff on my channel, and I primarily cover Ida. 
It's another one that allows underscores inside of numeric literals. They're kind of used as digit separators, like you would use a, a comma. Oh, let's not advance yet. Um, the issue is that the rules for where to put these underscores vary quite a bit between these languages. Uh, in some instances, you're allowed to have multiple underscores next to each other, while in other instances, that would be a violation. So, because of these specialized parsers, they have to make compromises. That winds up either strictly supporting one approach and kind of saying, eh, sorry, tough shit, for the other ones. Implementing all of the approaches, which means either you have a large set of these specialized parsers and need to pick the right one for your grammar. Uh, one single one that unifies these, but you have to specify the configuration for your grammar. Or, there's one other one, what was it? I don't know, but it, it winds up being a very complicated matter. And it's just sort of easier on everybody when you describe the grammar instead of what to parse. The same exact thing happens with how to specify bases. While many languages use the syntax that originated with C, there are other syntaxes for specifying a numerical base, and it creates that same kind of problem. So, finishing this up, some of the technical details about this approach, why it works, why it works well. The error reporting. Why mine was so efficient. The errors are not exceptions, at least not until you need them. There is an actual error type that are mapped to the exceptions. That is, there's a little tree of errors that is mapped to this own little otherwise identical tree of exceptions. Throughout the entire parser for the pattern. The errors are assigned. This winds up being considerably more lightweight than exceptions, clearly, because you're only assigning a structure with the relevant information inside of it. When you assign an exception, you wind up doing this whole stack information and other shit that gets carried along with it that makes it very, very heavy weight. But because of this mapping, well, I'll say this first. These errors allow you to get fine-grained information about the failure. So if you try parsing something and it doesn't match, it will tell you at what part of the pattern it failed at. Which is super helpful when debugging and is something that I really wish regex supported. But because of this mapping between the errors and exceptions, you can throw the corresponding exception. Uh, when you take the result type from the parse operation, and you can call a dot throw exception method, and it will automatically convert that to the appropriate exception and throw it. If there didn't happen to be an error, then that method call winds up doing nothing. So it is safe to use. You don't have to worry about null checks or anything like that. It's done for you. And clearly that significantly improved performance. Another thing to note is that the entire thing makes extensive use out of being mutatable. The whole thing with functional design that caused it to not scale well at all don't ever mutate something. Make everything immutable. It's got problems. I don't wholeheartedly di uh, disagree with it, though, because there are plenty of situations in which you don't want things to be mutatable. 
externally, that is, you as a consumer of this library, cannot mutate the source or the result objects. They are immutable as far as externally you can tell. Internally, you mutate the hell out of them. Um, for example, when parsing, the result object is created at the at the very beginning. When you call the parser that you're interested in, the result object is created immediately and is passed by reference through the entire chain, mutated the entire way. But what you get back out, you can't change at all. This, I feel, is the appropriate compromise between the two. Mutations are definitely faster. They're definitely much easier on the garbage collector. Or the amount of times you need to manually deallocate. Either way, you wind up doing more work when you do that. Slow things down. But it prevents the errors that accidental mutation can cause. Because you don't want to parse something, accidentally change the result, and then be wondering why you, you know, don't have what you expected you to have. And lastly, I want to finish this up by discussing how the self-optimization or the pattern rewriting works. So here we have a little pattern tree. Um, yeah, because in this instance, it definitely is a tree. It would be more correct to view it as sort of like a branch list, but it's here we definitely have a tree. Uh, there are three literals. We've got hello, a space. Those two are joined by a concatenator. And then we've joined that by a concatenator with the literal there. So it would parse hello there. As it turns out, parsing a literal is faster than parsing a concatenator. So, during construction time, you can replace concatenators of literals with another literal that has internally those concatenated. It's just slight tweaking, the result is exactly the same, but it winds up being faster. So if we concatenate the hello and the space, we can replace it with just a literal hello space concatenated with the literal there. Now here we also have two literals that are concatenated so we can do this rewrite again, getting hello there. And on that note, Hopefully you found this interesting. Try it out. Again, documentation is available. There's quite a bit of it. I have the link down in the video description. And until the next video, have a good one.